Hi guys, in this video we're going to go over everything you need to know for the year 8 topic of computer systems. It's a really good idea that you're familiar with year 7 computer systems and also year 7 performance before watching this video because this topic builds on what you learned in those two topics in year 7. To make your life easier I'm going to put the timestamps here and I'm also going to put them in the description below so you can skip to whatever bit it is that you need. <laughs> A computer system is a machine that processes data. So this is any type of machine that processes data. A lot of people when they think of computer systems just think of desktop computers. But mobile phones, games consoles, laptops, Chromebooks, all of these are types of computer system. So the word computer doesn't just mean desktop. Embedded systems are computers that are built into another device. So if you think about some of the household appliances you probably have in your kitchen, microwaves, ovens, washing machines, these now have computers built into them. We know it's got a computer built into it because we can see the small digital display. Some devices though still don't have computers built into them, so that is not an embedded device. Embedded devices give you more functionality, so this means you can do more things with your device than what you could do previously. A good rule of thumb when trying to think up different embedded devices is to think of things that existed before computers. So microwaves existed before they had a computer built into them. But now microwaves have computers built into them, we can see the counter count down so we know exactly how long it's going to be until our food is ready. Hardware is all the parts of the computer system that you can physically touch with your hands. So in year 7 you learnt about input, output and storage devices and RAM and ROM. These are all hardware because you can touch them with your hands. You also need to know about input and output devices that are built for disabled users. These are input or output devices that have been specifically built for people with disabilities. So someone who doesn't have any arms can't use a traditional mouse. So they might want to use a foot mouse. It works in exactly the same way, except instead of using your fingers to click on the buttons, you use your feet. For someone who is blind, you might want to use a braille keyboard or a braille printer so they can enter their data on the keyboard and then read it when it's been printed out. Eye trackers are used for people who don't have the movement of their limbs. This tracks where the pupil, that's the black part of your eye, is looking and then you can select the different buttons by just simply looking at them. Software is all the apps and programs that run on the computer system. For disabled users, especially blind people, software such as text-to-speech and speech-to-text is really useful. What text-to-speech does is it takes what you are saying and it types it in for you. If you've got a device in your home, so for example Google Home or Alexa, this works in pretty much the same way. You speak and the software recognises what you are saying and converts it into written text. The opposite of this is text-to-speech. What this does is it reads out the words on the computer for you so you know exactly what you're clicking on or exactly what you're typing or reading. Another piece of hardware is a graphics card or a GPU. Graphics cards are circuits that process graphics and image data. So this means that the CPU doesn't have to do all the fetch execute cycle parts that to do with graphics or images because the graphics card can do them instead. By having a graphics card that's powerful in your computer this can improve the system's performance. Your computer can run faster because the CPU can focus on other aspects of the fetch execute cycle and the graphics card will handle the fetch execute cycle for any images or graphics that need processing. So as we've already touched on, software is all the apps and programs that run on the computer system. In year 7 you learned about operating systems and how operating systems have six key features. For this topic you need to know about how the operating systems keep our computers secure. So these are operating system security features and there are four that you need to know about. Operating systems allow us to have different user accounts. So what this means is you can have an account that you use with all of your settings and files and programs installed. But you can also set up another account that someone else can use. This is useful for people who might not want everyone accessing all of their files. So if you think about at school, you are gone to your account, you can see your files, you can't see anybody else's files. Operating systems also keep our account secure by allowing us to set passwords. Having a username and a password that is unique to you stops other people from being able to access your account and any files that you might have stored. Operating systems also have encryption software installed. Encryption means turning your data into a code that people can't read without a special key. So you you will type in, for example, maybe your credit card details, the encryption software will turn it into a secret code, and then the online shop that you're trying to buy something from will have access to the key to unlock the code and know what your credit card number is. Anyone who's trying to hack the system though will see the code but not have access to the key and this is to help to keep data secure. Operating systems also have antivirus software and firewalls installed. Antivirus software will periodically scan your computer for any code it thinks is harmful. 
If it finds any code that it thinks is harmful, it will alert you. It doesn't automatically delete it because it might be wrong. It might have mistaken maybe one of your pictures for some harmful code, but it lets you know you've found something that it thinks might be a virus and lets you know so you can do something about it. Firewalls stop hackers from being able to access your system. So firewalls monitor all the data that is leaving and entering your computer. Anything that it thinks might be suspicious, it blocks. There are two key types of software that you can use or install. Open source software is written by a programming enthusiast. This means someone who enjoys programming, but maybe isn't employed by a company. Because of this, open source software is usually free. You can usually also see the source code and edit it if you want. This means that if you download and use open source software, what you can do is you can change it and then re-upload it and other people can download it. What it doesn't mean is that any changes you make to the software is gonna automatically update to everyone else's machines. That's not how it works. If you think about when you download software from the App Store, you have to install updates. If you download some software and then you change it on your computer, it will be changed for you, but it won't be changed for anybody else unless you re-upload it and then people download your version. So open source software is usually free, but because it's been written by a programming enthusiast, not by a company, it can contain bugs, it might not work properly, there might not be any updates because they're not obliged to make it any better because they've done it in their spare time, and there might not be any tutorials available on how to use it. The alternative to open source software is proprietary software. Proprietary software is written by a company. In order to use the software, you have to accept a license. So when you're trying to download it or install it, you have to click to say you've read the terms and conditions. Usually you have to pay a fee in order to buy it or install it, and you can't see or edit the source code. So the biggest advantages to using proprietary software is because it is made by a company, they probably will put out help sheets and tutorials on how to use it because they want people to buy it. They'll also update it, so any bugs that are found will be fixed. Usually updates come for free or a very small cost, but the biggest disadvantage is that you have to pay for it. When you're saving files on your computer or you're transferring data to and from the internet, data happens in units. In maths, the number system you learn about is called deanery or decimal, and the numbers are zero through to nine. There are 10 digits in total. Computers don't work like this. Computers work in binary, which is zeros and ones. A zero or a one by itself is called a bit. If you have eight bits, this is called a byte. And then after this, computers work in 1024s. If you have 1024 bytes, it's called a kilobyte. If you have 1024 kilobytes, it's called a megabyte. If you have 1024 megabytes, it's called a gigabyte. If you have 1024 gigabytes, if you have 1024 gigabytes, it's called a terabyte. The more units you can store, the more expensive your secondary storage device will be, the more units you can transfer to and from the internet, the more expensive your internet plan will be. However, the advantage is you will be able to store more data. So that's more music, download more games, have more pictures. Character sets are all of the letters, numbers and symbols recognised by you from their binary representation. So you might see the letter L, but the computer instead sees a string of zeros and ones. There are different types of character sets. ASCII is a character set that can represent 128 characters. So this includes all of the letters and numbers on a basic keyboard. But the problem with ASCII is that there are more than just the English letters that need representing. If you speak Chinese, for example, having access to the English characters available in ASCII isn't going to be very useful to you. So because of this, a second character set called Unicode was invented. Unicode is a character set that can represent 6 million different characters. So because Unicode was invented, the character sets could be expanded to include things like emojis. What you will notice though is that between different operating systems, sometimes the emojis aren't recognised and it comes up as a little blank square. What this means is, is there is a problem with the two character sets on the different devices you are using. When the user typed in the character, it got converted to binary and then the person receiving the message opened it but their computer didn't know what that binary meant. So it put a little blank square in there just to say, there's supposed to be something here, but I don't know what that is. 